Bokitov Khabrim, I'm Stephen Benoun. You're watching Israeli News Live. We have breaking stories coming out of Ukraine and, of course, out of Syria. Tulsi Gabbard, the congresswoman who went on a secret fact-finding mission. Now, the, the mission was actually public to start with, but she did it secretly for her own safety and traveling, according to uh, U.S. officials there. But uh, she has finished her mission uh, flying into Beirut and then into Syria, meeting with both the uh, President Bashar al-Assad, the opposition leaders, uh, as well as civilians there, trying to gauge what is in fact going on inside of Syria. And as we have reported to you here on Israeli News Live, uh, from all the different aspects that we had been able to gather from uh, the different people that were involved, peace, peace uh, uh, heads that went there, that came back, spoke to the United Nations, uh, we, we've seen it with journalists Vanessa Beely, Ava Bartlett, uh, all showing that this is a conspiracy, a war being fought against President Bashar al-Assad that had no bearing whatsoever, no justification, in fact, in all the propaganda that's been coming out, even from uh, peace uh, activists that have gone there that have clearly showed us that it is a propaganda war against President Bashar al-Assad trying to topple him. For what reason? Uh, there's a lot of different ideas that we could speculate upon. But uh, in this case here, uh, Congresswoman uh, Representative Tulsi Gabbard goes there on her own funding, in fact, to do a fact-finding mission. And one statement in here that is so provocative, I want to share here what RT writes here. Gabbard also met with several leaders of the Syrian opposition who spearheaded the anti-government protests in 2011. She says, some of them believe that the originally peaceful uprising was hijacked by jihadists. This is what she said, quote, funded and supported by Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Qatar, the United States, end quote. I mean, this is just provocative to say the very least. And it only is another corroboration along with the information that have come out from the peace activists, the, the, the different journalists, Vanessa Beely, Ava Bartlett, uh, Murad Gazdiev, who uh, is with uh, RT reporter there out of, uh, who's been there on the ground in Syria, the reporting he has done, and uh, in many others, even uh, the parliament member from Turkey, Aaron Erdem, who was uh, railroaded by the Turkish government for speaking out about the funding of ISIS, the ISIS members crossing the border, and even the sarin gas that was blamed on Bashar al-Assad against his own people in 2013. All these things are, are, are building up more and more momentum that this war, in fact, was an illegal war to begin with against a sovereign nation to topple the democracy of this country. And this is something that Tulsi has added to. Now, the question remains now, will President Trump uh, do something about it? Will he stop funding these terrorists inside of this country? 35 nationalities are fighting there against pay jihadist fighting against Bashar al-Assad and his government. And I don't say that Bashar al-Assad is some angel or saint either when I say this. I'm just telling you the facts as we know it. Or will he continue on as planned the information that was shared by General Wesley Clark when he spilled the beans, so to speak, on the U.S. government's plans to take down all these different Arabic nations, including Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, and Saudi, excuse me, uh, Syria and Iran. Now, the, we know as it is right now what the way uh, President Trump is headed, we are definitely going to be headed towards a war with Iran. So it's very good possibility that yes, Iran will go down. And I know that he has done a, a freeze on the, uh, uh, the assets going to the Palestinians. He has also done a freeze on moving the embassy, the talks on moving the embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. But keep in mind, friends, uh, even if we move the embassy to, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, that has nothing to do with Israel per se, other than to kind of say that yes, Jerusalem is Israel's capital. All Jews know that Jerusalem is our capital. It has always been our capital and will always remain so. And, uh, you know, although I do appreciate many of the policies of President Trump, I do want to caution people. We need to not lift him up to a place as a savior, especially even the place that some people have suggested that President Trump is like that of Cyrus, uh, the, the, the man back in Babylonian times that freed uh, the, the Jewish people to send them back home and to restore the building of their third temple. We read over in the book of Ezra, we see that he has... Uh, 
that he says that the Lord actually, uh, Yahweh himself gave him this commission to do so. But if you read the Cyrus Cylinder, and we're, my wife's going to be doing a special broadcast on that. We were there in Britain at the Cyrus Cylinder there, and we have seen the actual translation of it uh, according to Cyrus's own words in the cylinder that he commissioned to be written. Marduk was the God that told him to do this and not Yahweh. Could it be a mistranslation? I don't really know the facts on this, but nonetheless, you want to be careful where we place President Trump in this type of category here. And again, he is not the Messiah to Israel. Although I do appreciate his stand with Israel. I appreciate the fact that um, he has taken a stand with abortion, things of this nature. But it's still at the same time, I want to caution uh, as we look at things, as we move forward, because there's many things that uh, I'm very concerned about. And one of those still is with Russia here in Europe. He has not stopped the flow of military, nor the helping of, of all the... Uh, in Ukraine, sending in the troops there, more and more weapons and things are being sent still yet to Europe. The situation with Russia is not slowing down a single bit, and it's not a number one agenda on, for him, a war that could easily spiral out of control in his own administration, and he's not slowing it down. And that's a major concern. Speaking of the war itself, let me share something with you here. Viktor uh, Konovets. Uh, put on here, and I got this also from Mikhail. Mikhail said 10 hours ago that there was fighting uh, south of, I believe, of Donbass, heavy, heavy artillery shelling from Kiev on the, uh, uh, the Donetsk People's Republic there. And now, two hours ago, under heavy fire, Donetsk itself is under heavy fire uh, at 20, 2230 hours last night, heavy shelling felt and heard in the center of the town. Uh, Kiev is definitely starting to try to take back eastern Ukraine from the separatists that are there. And we know that Russia, even though President Putin has said they have not, Russia has been very much actively trying to help the Russian citizens that are in that area because they saw the genocide that was being done by the Ukrainian government. And some may differ with that, but there's a very interesting article that just came out on Tactical Investor uh, called Ukraine Exposed Kiev's Gestapo Government in Action. Just briefly, I'll share a little bit of this with you says from the very start of the uh, Ukrainian crisis, Washington neoconservative lobby has sought to downplay the less appealing aspects of the government that came to power in Kiev in February and May. A, conv a convictical of Western intellectuals took place in Kiev under the auspices of a new republic. They attended a five-day conference called Ukraine Thinking Together. Now, you have to understand, some of the people that got involved in this in the neo-Nazi uh, atmosphere is what they were developing. But don't think that the U.S. is shying away from it. The U.S. is the one that created it. It was, we see John McCain there. We see uh, um, George Soros there. Many, many of the different leaders there. Uh, and we know, according to John Stockwell, the former uh, CIA director of operations who has stated, stated uh, conclusively that the CIA has very much been involved in toppling democratic governments around the world, especially in Central and South America. Uh, in places of this here. But it goes on to say, one of the conferences of the co-organizer, Yale historian Timothy Snyder, declared that Ukraine is a European present. We have now reached uh, a, a point where Ukraine history and European history are very much the same things for good or for evil. But examples of the new authorita authorita authoritarianism gripping Kiev have become tougher to miss in recent months, so much that there are signs that perhaps even Washington establishment is beginning to feel some discomfiture uh, at the actions of its new Ukrainian clients. In September, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty reported the Ukrainian Defense Ministry was creating a special service to, among other things, get rid of the Russian fifth column in the Ukraine armed forces. The Ukrainian Defense uh, Minister, Valery uh, Heletri, said the new service would be based on the Stalin era smarish. It would expose and dispose of enemy agents by some estimates, smash the Russian language acronym for special methods of detecting spies sent upwards of 600,000 former Soviet POWs to the Gulag uh, after the war. Uh, in October, Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko signed a decree establishing October 14 as an official day of Ukrainian defenders to commemorate the anniversary of the funding of the wartime UPA. 
Uh, where is it all headed to, friends? What are we looking at right here? We are seeing another Hitler type of scenario inside of Ukraine, something that the Obama administration has fueled with fever in order to topple uh, Petro, uh, excuse me, uh, President Yanukovych. And uh, now Petro Poroshenko, who has also been uh, said by many to be a um, CIA operative that is actually running the country. Another point here, the UPA worked hand in hand with the Poland's Nazis occupiers killing uh, to take but one example, nearly 10,000 Poles over the night of July 11th to the 12th, 1943, a feature of the UPA action, according to uh, uh, Kanakski, was its sheer barbarity. They were not content merely to shoot their victims, but often tortured them first and desecrated their bodies afterwards. All of this was well known, yet Poroshenko still took to Twitter to declare UPA soldiers an example of heroism and patriotism to Ukraine. Full story. There's a full story. You can see the rest of the story about this. We'll post the links for you here in our broadcast below. So we are clearly seeing a rise of neo-Nazism in Ukraine in such a way that is very, very uh, disheartening. No wonder why uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, when this uprising began, called on all Jews in Ukraine to, to come home to Israel. It is not a safe place, and it's definitely not a safe place for Jews, nor is it a safe place for the Russian people that uh, or Russian descendants that are living in this country. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom. Thank you.